Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to start because I couldn't, for some reason, I couldn't get into Facebook. All right. We're going to start the uh, lesson today. Good thing you guys are here. You see? Waiting for you guys. Uh, today is January the 29th, 2023. And we're going to continue with the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to be here one more time to continue with the book of Revelation. Let this be a blessing. Give us your, uh, your wisdom. Give us your strength so we can uh, understand your word and put it into practice. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read the, the text. Only five verses, but uh, it's uh, very meaningful. The title of the lesson is Seven Seal and the Golden Censer. Verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was giving much incense to offer, with the prayers of all God's people, on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came perils of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and of an earthquake. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, verse 1. Nico, would you please read verse 1? When he opened the seventh seal, um, there was silence in heaven for about Okay, we've been talking about the last few weeks about the, the seals, when they opened the first seal, the second seal, the second, third seal. And now the only uh, person that was uh, qualified uh, to open the seventh seal is Jesus Christ. And that's why we come to this point. So with the breaking of the seventh seal, the seventh seal reveals the, uh, the future of mankind and the punishment or rewards they're going to get. With the breaking of the seventh seal comes the second series of judgments. The seven trumpets. Apparently, the judgments announced by the trumpets follow chronologically those of the other seals. The seventh seal on the scroll is open, finally allowing to be unrolled. As you remember, the first few seals, the first seal, as you remember, was the Cold War, which was uh, uh, represented by a white horse, a conqueror, meaning that uh, this, uh, this person will conquer uh, kingdoms only by uh, diplomacy. I remember very, very much uh, World War II in which Hitler, uh, from 1932 to 1939, conquered uh, countries by diplomacy, like uh, Czechoslovakia, Austria, and other things, you know, until finally it started the, uh, the real war, which was in September 1939. So the second seal, that was open war, very, a red horse. And then when war started, a real war, you have bloodshed, killing, and war. Then the third famine, Famine, the third seal was a famine, a black hole. As a consequence of war and devastation, of course, it could be fa uh, famine. And the uh, fourth seal is death, of course, a pale horse. As a consequence of all that, people die. And then the fifth seal, people sometimes kill themselves or, or give themselves to, uh, to be killed for the, for the faith. And uh, then the, physical, the sixth seal, the physical disturbances, meaning that uh, punishment is going to be uh, done on the earth, like uh, earthquakes, uh, floods, and all that thing. So, those are the six seals. Now comes the seventh seal. The, the seventh seal is a continuation of the sixth, where the first, first five seals deal with the entire period of church age, the last two deal with the final judgment. Then they said it was silence in heaven. In the Old Testament, silence is associated with divine judgment. In the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk in the, and the book of Zechariah, God is pictured as being in his temple and about to bring judgment on the earth. So it, it's like a, the calm before the storm. The book of Zephaniah, silence is likewise, likewise commanded in connection with the great day of the Lord and of his judgment, forming part of the Old Testament background to the phrase, the great day of the wrath. These announcements of judgment from the minor prophets express cosmic end time expectation. Yeah, remember that cosmic entire, that means the whole world is going to be involved, which are explicitly expressed in the universal sense. It is like a, a meteor striking the earth, like a, it's a world upheaval, you know. Uh, when you hear the day of the Lord, 
that's a terrifying thing because bad things are going to happen to the wicked, but good things to the, to the believer. That the temple in, is in heaven is to be assumed from the text of Ezekiel 1. At the moment that this judgment is to be delivered, God commands the earth to be silent. So before the uh, before judgments are going to be applied to the earth, it's going to be silence. That's an eerie silence. That's terrifying. Like I said before, it's like the calm before the storm, you know. Uh, <clears throat> for about half an hour, he says here the, the text, this brief period of, of time might not refer so much to the precise duration of the silence, but it does emphasize the suddenness unexpected of the decreed, decreed judgment. It also seems to mark a brief but a significant break between the unsealing of the scroll and the trumpet judgment. It is an eerie silence before the storm, like we said before, and all heaven awaits a coming judgment. This is a dramatic pause before the next series of plaques. The final act of the drama is left and disclosed here, reserved to be presented. So this is a, a preamble. This is like a, the beginning of the, of the bad things that are going to happen to the earth. So the silence is broken only by the prayers of the saints. You know, the prayers of the saints were already in heaven, and they were telling the, the Lord by praying, when are you going to judge those wicked people? Because the wicked people have gotten away with murder for a long time. So this is the time that's coming. <clears throat> so the silence is broken by the prayers of all the saints. As such, they are God's response to, how long, O oh Lord, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The thought is that this final judgment of God is so awful that the whole world falls utterly silent in his presence. It's interesting that the Jewish writing silence is associated not only with the divine judgment, but also with the fact that the prayers of the faithful for that judgment are being heard. John does not give any further details here of the punishment of the wicked because he will do so in later chapters. Now, if you remember when the, the Assyrians were trying to... Uh, invade Jerusalem, and the king Hezekiah was praying and praying and praying, and because of the prayers, an angel of the Lord defeated all the Assyrians, and they had to go home. So the prayers of the saints do have uh, uh, results. Now, I was um, listening to the radio on the way here, and uh, they were talking about that uh, the creation of the nation of Israel was uh, a tremendous thing in 1948, you know, and uh, people did not believe that the nation was going to be created just like that. But he missed a very important thing, that the nation of Israel was created because of the Holocaust, too. The Holocaust was that, that they killed like six million Jews, and people in the world were so affected that they would have a, a tendency of the, of the world to uh, help the Jewish people. That's why in the United Nations, Israel was created. Even, even Russia voted in favor of the creation of Israel. Of course, the Arab nations were against it, and there was a war. You know, the first of the world. But it was not by accident. Sometimes a bad thing had to happen before a good thing happens. The Holocaust happened so the nation of Israel can be created. That's terrible, but that, that's the way I see it. <clears throat> Verse uh, 2, um, Romain. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. The commentator said that this verse seems to be out of place. You know, it's not a continuation of verse 1. This verse really belongs in verse 7 or verse 6. That's what it says here. Uh, let me read the way that text said. <clears throat> this particular verse, A2, appears to be an interruption for the last judgment scenario. Continuing verse 3 and 5. It seems out of place by introducing a new series of judgment, which is not picked up until verse 6. The narration of the trumpet series resumes in verse 6. John sees seven angels holding seven trumpets. The seven angels could be identified with the seven guardian angels or the seven churches that we study chapter 2 and 3. The sounding of the trumpet had more than one significance in the Old Testament. It was used to gather the lost people, to assemble the Lord's army, to announce a new king, and to proclaim the year Jubilee. In this context, the sounding of trumpets indicates a declaration of war. The judgment of the seven trumpets unfold in a parallel, in a pattern, parallel to the unsealing of the seven sealed scroll. The seven trumpets of the book of Revelation announces a series of plagues more severe than the seals that we're going to see in later chapters. Okay, Let's go to verse 3. Uh, Carlos? Okay. 
Okay, <clears throat> so verse 3 says, another angel who had a golden censer. Censer is a, is a like bowl which you put incense there. Um, it stands at the altar. This must be the angel of the presence or even be Christ himself. The altar is in view, it's the same under which the souls of the persecuted saints. Remember in the last, the last lesson we saw the throne of God and series of circles. Okay? The first circle was the uh, elders, then it was the uh, uh, the creatures, then it was the uh, saints, and then it was the throne of God. All right? So, the angel was giving much incense to offer, which means he was given by God. And showing, as says where in Revelation, that the angel is an agent of God whose actions really indicate prior divine decision. But all this, Christ is represented to us as interceding for his saints that were to live after this time, to the no troubles that were immediately to begin and to following during the reign of the Antichrist. The angel does not provide the incense, is given to him by Christ, uh, whose meritorious obedience and death are the incense rendering the saints' prayers well pleasing to God. So it is not the saints who give the angel the incense, nor are their prayers identified with the incense, nor their prayers offered to him. Christ alone is the mediator through whom, unto whom prayer is to be offered. You know, in the Old Testament Jewish thought, the angels sometimes were inter intermediaries, like uh, people will talk to an angel, an angel will talk to God. In the New Testament, it doesn't happen like that. We pray directly to God. There is no intermediaries. There is no mediators. The only mediator is Jesus Christ. All right? So remember that. So uh, a lot of religions put a lot of, uh, you cannot get to God directly. You got to go through these steps. It's not true. You know that. He said, when, with the prayers of all the God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. This is consistent with the fact that the saints presented the prayer directly to God, like we said, and not to an angel, which demonstrates the direct access to the divine throne as priest. Most commentators consider the incense to be mingled with prayers. When I was in the Catholic Church, and then we used to pray, and used to have incense. So as we pray, the incense will fill the whole church. That was in the Old Testament. We don't do that in the New Testament. But some religions have things from the Old Testament, and they still... And that's a distraction, to really, because that time we could be used to praise God, and to pray, and to really uh, study the Word. All these things, external things, are distractions, I think. The response to the prayers is that punishment cannot be executed until the number of God's people destined for persecution is completed. We studied that last week. This cannot happen until history comes to an end. So the saints praying on earth and the angels incense in heaven are simultaneously. The prayers both of the saints in the heavenly rest and of those militants on earth are presented on the golden altar in front of the throne. The martyrs, which is an addition to it, cry is the foremost and brings down the ensuing judgment. So all this is in preparation for the judgment that's going to be placed on the earth. And we're going to come to the verse 4. Uh, Wanda? The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Okay, this is a repetition we've been talking about. The fact that the smoke of the incense goes up with the prayers of God's people shows that the petition of chapter 6, 9, and 10 is now being presented before God. In the Bible, incense is always associated with sacrifice, so that the sacrifice accompanied by the pleasing aroma will be acceptable to God. This verse echoes Leviticus 16, when the priest also takes the censer, full the coals of the altar. This is like at the Old Testament, like we were saying before. In Psalm 141, 2, prayer is associated with incense, when he says, may my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like an evening sacrifice. So, in conclusion here in this uh, verse, although the angel is involved in presenting the prayers to the saints of God, he does not make it acceptable. He's not the mediator. The Jewish apocalyptic concept of the angels as mediators finds no place in the New Testament. Angels did function as mediators in the Old Covenant era. But there is no record of such a medi mediator function part of the angels in a new covenant era. So let's do it one more time. Uh, when Christ died, you, you know, in the Old Testament, as we studied before, there was this temple, and there were a lot of steps, you know, the court of the women, the court of the Gentiles, the court of the Israelites, 
And then in the center was the Holy of Holies. Only the priest could go there once a year. And there was a veil around it. Okay? Only the priest would take the sins of the people and present it to the God. So only a, one priest had the right to do there once a year. But when Christ died, the veil was ripped from top to bottom. That means that symbolically we have access, everybody, to the Lord of Lords, to God himself. So our prayers go directly to God. There is no, you know, when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman in the, on the well, uh, she was saying, you know, you Jews praise uh, God in Jerusalem temple, we praise God here. And Jesus said to her, there's going to come a time where you don't need to go to a temple. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to go anywhere because you can praise God and to God anywhere you want. So you can be in a deserted island and you can be praising God by yourself. Okay? So if you go to Europe and you see the cathedrals there and you're going to see how magnificent, but they, they're not doing that to praise for praising God. They're doing that to praise the architects, you know, who designed those things because we don't need all those things. You know, a church like this doesn't have any icons. So who are who is the church? The people. Once we live here, this is going to be an empty room. Once we leave the church, the people leave this building, it's going to be an empty building. So to portray a building like uh, worshiping God is wrong. I remember uh, when I was uh, in school, I was studying architecture. There was this uh, architect from Spain. His name was Antonio Gaudí. And he made this uh, building called La Sagrada Familia, the Holy Family. Uh, he started in 19, I think, 06. And, uh, and then he died, and uh, he was run over by a streetcar. And nobody knew who he was until a week later. Okay? But his building was so elaborate that uh, it still hadn't been finished. A century later, more than a century later, hasn't been finished, you know, because they tried to make it so elaborate that for God not, and God said, you don't need that. You know, when, when David wanted to build a, a temple for God, uh, God said to him, did I ever ask you to build me a temple? Do you think uh, four walls are going to be sufficient for me? No. So the physical environment is not that important as what's inside of the heart of the believers. Does that make any sense to you guys? Yeah. Okay. So verse 5, uh, I guess Nico? Then the angel took the sensor, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came pearls of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and earthquakes. Okay, as I stated before in the previous verses, this verse demonstrates that God has heard and answer the prayers of the saints. For the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth, to signify that God's judgment are about to descend on the earth. The prayers have gone up, and the sprinkle of the ashes toward the earth is a symbol of the answer descending from heaven. We might recall a similar action of Moses before Pharaoh, when he took ashes of the furnace and sprinkled it toward heaven, but he descended towards earth as a symbol of the plague about to fall upon the land. The hot ashes are the tokens of the coming judgment. Remember when the, the Israelites were leaving uh, Egypt, the plagues, the seven plagues that uh, assaulted the, uh, the Egyptians? That was a terrible thing. So, in breaking the silence in heaven, the prayers of God's people for God to act in judgment have been responded with thunder, rumbling, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That's that's the thing that God is going to, you know, do upon the earth. This is almost identical to a description of the last judgment. And it's rooted in the description of divine judgment in the Old Testament. Particularly in the, at Sinai. In, in Isaiah 29.6, we read, The Lord Almighty will come with thunder and earthquake and great noise with windstorm and tempest and flames of the burning fire. Now, well, all these things are going to happen. It's not going to be locally. It's going to be worldwide. And everybody's going to see that. Now, you have heard that uh, the second coming of Christ, okay? Uh, the second coming of Christ is going to take, it's going to be two events. One event is a rapture, where the Christian church is going to be raptured, taken away. The second event is uh, Christ coming, 
the proper coming, uh, where everybody's going to see. Because prior to Christ's coming, it's going to happen all these things in the earth. You know, the stars are going to fall. This is gonna, people are going to die. And of course, it's not going to come like a thief in the night. You know, the rapture is going to be like a thief in the night because nobody, nobody's going to know. But the second, the, the second coming proper, everybody's going to know because they're going to have these uh, terrible things happening prior to him coming. So, the judgment comes to all the unfaithful, of course. Those upon whose foreheads God's angel did not give a protection. Exactly as the saints have their foreheads sealed in Revelation 7.3, so that they will be protected in a similar way. The pattern of this passage follows broadly some of the Old Testament depictions of divine judgment against sinners. It starts with prayer for help, divine response to prayer, which lends to fire proceeding from the heavenly temple to consume the persecuted. The ones who are going to be judged are the wicked people, those not bearing the seal. Those not bearing the seal will suffer final punishment. Now, sometimes when we, we think that uh, uh, eventually people, wicked people are going to go to hell, and they're going to be in a lake of fire. And uh, you may say, well, how can it be a lake of fire if you are a spirit? How the flames are going to affect you? But we also have to remember that we're going to be resurrected with the body. You know, our body is going to be here, and uh, our spirit is going to go with the Lord. You know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We're going to be in paradise. Paradise is not really a, a place. It's really being with the Lord. When the thief on the cross was dying, he said to the Lord, remember me uh, when you go into the kingdom. And Christ said to him, today you're going to meet with me in paradise. That means today I'm going to die and you're going to die and we're both going to be together. So being with Christ is being in paradise. Eventually, after the millennium ring, we're going to be in heaven and the wicked is going to be in hell. How the wicked is going to suffer? The first, first thing is going to be separation from God. Second is going to be a terrible punishment that we cannot even imagine. Whether it's going to be flames or not flames, that's beside the point. But it's going to be a terrible time for everybody. So, just by common sense, <laughs> but, but, but especially by faith, we will be wise to, uh, uh, to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior and live a Christian life. Not only read the Bible, but apply. You know, so, so I usually, when I... When I pray, I said, uh, give me your wisdom to understand your word. Uh, give me your strength so I can apply what I do learn into our everyday life. A Christian life had to be lived every day, okay, 24-7. You cannot do it any other way. Okay, so this concludes this particular lesson. Do you have any questions or any comments about this lesson? No, no. As a mediator. Oh, okay. okay. In the Old Testament, sometimes an angel was like a mediator between man and God. But in the New Testament, the, medi the only mediator is Jesus Christ. But they can come to help us. Yeah, for example, Mary came, uh, Gabriel, the angel, announced to Mary things that was going to happen. Which also, an angel. Born yet, though, huh? so. Right. So that's still kind of... Still that's like before the... Uh, right. Uh, and, and then the New Testament it starts when Jesus dies, really. Mm. Okay? Actually. Because uh, it's, like a, it's like the will. When you make a will, let's say you are old, like uh, some of us, and you make a will. I uh, leave all my possessions to my son. And uh, that only comes to him when you die. Okay? Mm. So the will of the Lord came into effect when he died. Mm -hmm. That's a will and testament. Okay? While he was alive, it still was not in effect. Anything else? But the thing is there are other roles for angels in the current world. Yeah. Angels can come to give you a message to strengthen you. I there is a whole thing about angels uh, that people have written about. Like, a, you know, you have a protecting angel and things like that. But as a mediator, as you pray, you pray goes directly to God. Okay? okay. That's, that's the connection. It was you, God the Father, and God the Son. That thing. 
so you have direct access to the king of kings lord of lords anything else okay let me let me finish with a with a prayer Heavenly father we thank you for having us uh, study your word uh, and i just wish that uh, may the lord protect you and guide you to the to the rest of the week may this day will be a blessed day for you and the rest of the week will be a blessed week and let the lord give you strength and wisdom so you can study the word of god every day and put it into practice and be a a light for the people which you meet either a place of work or a place of school or whatever you spend the rest of the week in the name of jesus we pray amen okay so let me finish this thing